So today's agenda, we're going to talk about why HACCP is important, what HACCP yeah, is, where you um, start or review, and how you can write your plan and update your plan. And please remember to mute your microphone. Your microphone usually, the little icon is usually in the bottom left. Hopefully, um, towards the end of the day, we will be going into chat rooms. And when we do, you'll enter your chat room and make sure you know what number you are in. Choose a recorder who will record your responses and send them to beth.haws at nebraska.gov. Also choose a leader who will report back to the group when we come back to talk about um, our activity. And I'll go over those instructions again prior to going into the chat rooms. So why is HACCP important? <clears throat> Children are at the more risk than others. Being in schools and in confined places with a large amount of people make it a high risk situation. Children between the ages of zero and nine are at more risk than others because their immune systems. <clears throat> and we also have children who are immune compromised that we may or may not know about. Food has many opportunities to become contaminated. Microorganisms like to evolve. They can mutate under the right conditions Plus, we have new microorganisms that have been discovered in recent years. What is HACCP? HACCP stands for Hazardous Analysis and Critical Control Points. That means that we have to identify the hazards that could possibly occur to the food and find the critical control points that will prevent, eliminate, reduce the number of microorganisms to safe levels. HACCP is a federally required law, not a state or local. It's public law 108-265. It was passed in 2004 and it was implemented into the school districts in the school year 2005-2006. <clears throat> With the HACCP requirement, Section 111 addresses additional requirement that food safety inspections must be posted in publicly visible locations, not in a notebook. <clears throat> Copies of the report must be provided to anyone that requests the report. <clears throat> NDE Nutrition Services must ensure that the current health inspection report is posted in a visible location. And we usually do that during our administrative reviews. <clears throat> HACCP was designed in 1960 by Pillsbury Company. It was designed to prevent the U.S. astronauts from getting a foodborne illness while they're in space. That wouldn't have been good if they, if they get a foodborne illness up there. There's not much they could do. <clears throat> and it was based on science and common sense. So what they did was they swabbed every area that food was in contact and then they created their HACCP plan. <clears throat> HACCP is a preventive rather than a reactive way to control and combat microorganisms. HACCP is based on science, but is common sense approach to food safety. HACCP identifies significant biological, chemical, 
physical hazards at specific points within a product's flow through the time or through the kitchen. So from the time that you purchase to the time that it's served, we look at everything that could affect the food and make it unsafe. Once those um, hazards have been identified, they can be prevented, eliminated, and reduced to safe levels. <clears throat> HACCP looks for many opportunities that food has for contamination. We need to look for ways we can control the microorganisms. We follow the flow of the food and the path that the food takes through your operation. It begins when you purchase the food and ends when you serve it. So for instance, if you have hamburger <clears throat> come in because you're gonna be serving hamburgers, do you order those in raw, in bulk raw, or patties? Or do you order them in pre-cooked patties? <clears throat> How do you receive those? Are they received, if they're frozen, are they solid and don't show any signs of thawing and uh, refreezing? So they don't have any ice crystals in them, they don't have any purge in them, or do you bring them in um, pre-cooked and they come in frozen and they are solid. You don't have to worry about whether you're gonna get cross-contaminated if they are dripping purge from them. <clears throat> and then you look to see once you, if they're frozen, how are you going to thaw them when they go into the refrigeration? Less likely to cross-contaminate if they are pre-cooked, but some people handle raw very well. It's up to each school. <clears throat> and then you have to think about how you're gonna cook it. <clears throat> the pre-cooked hamburgers must go to 165 for 15 seconds. The raw hamburger patties would only have to go to 155 for 17 seconds. And that is a change in the food code this year that any ground meat except for poultry has to be held at 155 or has to be cooked to 155 for 17 seconds instead of 15. Ground poultry always goes to 165 no matter what <clears throat> for 15 seconds. So what are the critical control points? What can we control? We can control time, making sure that it's not in the temperature danger zone for more than four hours, so that you're quickly prepping and getting it back into the refrigeration, or you prep and go directly to the ovens. You're gonna cook it to the proper temperatures, and you have to know what those proper temperatures are, because depending on the food, if it's a vegetable or a fruit that you're heating, those only have to go to 135. <clears throat> if it is a beef or pork roast, you only have to take those up to 145 and you have to keep the thermometer and they have to maintain that 145 for four minutes. <clears throat> if it's a chicken poultry item, it has to go to 165. Now your ground meats, such as pork and beef and fish have to go to 155 for 17 seconds. The poultry, no matter what it is, has to be cooked to 165 for 15 seconds. <clears throat> Hand washing. We can control how well our employees and staff wash their hands and how frequently by good training. Cross-contamination. We can control cross-contamination by having our employees make sure that they are changing their gloves and uh, washing their area and all utensils and cutting boards when they go to another item and start preparing. Because we would never want anyone 
to go from doing a raw meat or a poultry and then doing fresh fruits or vegetables. And that has happened. It's <clears throat> and has caused foodborne illnesses. Thank goodness, not in our state, but it has happened. Chemicals and pesticides. We have to be very diligent that we keep the chemicals away and that we are t doing our test strips for our sanitizers to make sure that they are correct amount of sanitizer and we're not going to cause a chemical um, contamination by having them too strong. So read the bottles or the instructions from the manufacturer. And <clears throat> some chemicals look like flour, oats, salt, so it's easy to get them confused. So that is why they are out of the kitchen. They're stored separately from food. Our staff health. We can keep our staff <clears throat> separated or out of the kitchen if they are sick. Staff that, are, that have a severe cough, if they have nausea, dumb, diarrhea, or if they are vomiting, they must not be in the kitchen and must be restricted. And preferably they stay at home so they're not spreading to everyone. Another thing that we can control is who is in your kitchen and at prep areas. When I first started out in the food service industry, we didn't worry too much about food defense and, and terrorist attacks. But now we have to think about those things from disgruntled employees, students, playing tricks, um, or maybe your vendor is not happy with you and they do something. We just never know. <clears throat> and again, those have happened in other states, but Nebraska has, thank goodness, has never had one of those at this time. Because as soon as we say never, it will happen. And then we can train our employees so that they are knowledgeable on food safety and they are, help keep everyone safe. <clears throat> so, HACCP is a process <clears throat> approach to food safety. It's not a reactive one. <clears throat> there are seven steps. Step one is establishing standard operating procedures. You all should have standard operating procedures in your notebook and we will go over those on August the 13th if you join us. If not, you can watch the recording and it talks about updating those. We should all have standard operating procedures that are based on the 2016 food code. That is the current one. <clears throat> We unfortunately, the COVID knocked out the food code for this year. We don't know if it will make it into the Senate's, um, for the senators, state senators to vote or not um, in this short session to finish up what they had missed because of COVID. <clears throat> we are hoping that it does get passed. And if it does, we will have a new food code sometime in January of 2021. If not, we will have it in July of 2021. <clears throat> the biggest change is the ground meats being cooked to 145 for 17 seconds. <clears throat> Step two is we're gonna divide all the food into three process. The no cook process, the cook and serve process, in the complex process, which is cooking, cooling, reheating, and service. And any time that you, maybe you have some hamburgers left over and you don't wanna throw them away. You need to have hamburgers in the complex process because if you have them in your refrigerator and the 
health department comes and they see those there, they're going to ask to see a cooling log. Because it has become, even though you usually cook and serve, any leftovers become the complex process. <clears throat> Step three is establish control measures, the CCCs and the SOPs for each of the three processes. And we will be doing that today. Like, let's get you started. <clears throat> establish monitoring procedures and establishing corrective actions. <clears throat> Step six is re keeping records. All food safety records must be kept for one year plus the current. So all of your um, food safety logs, your HACCP logs, you need to keep for one year plus the current year. So your checklist summaries, your sanitizing uh, solution, uh, where you dip your little pH um, strip into the sanitizer to make sure it's correct, your cooking temperatures, all of those. One year plus the current. Step seven, review and revise your HACCP plan annually to make sure that you are up and current on the food code. And it's also a great way to train your staff members. They can read the HACCP plan for you. <clears throat> so, how do we get started? <clears throat> We're gonna write a description of the HACCP plan. And what that is, it's who you are. Your sponsor name, the site name, if it's different from your sponsor name, some of us only have one site and some of us have multiple sites, lots of multiple sites. And you're gonna type whether you're self-operated, a satellite, you have a food service management company, centralized kitchen, if you're a finishing, or if you're vended. And then you're gonna put the name and title of your lead food service employee on this site. And you want to do this in a Word document or some type of a document that you can change very easily. The number of employees you have this year, you may have to add your some paras maybe, if they're going to be helping you serve in the cafeteria to combat um, the COVID. <clears throat> and then you're going to put the type of HACCP method, and we're using the process approach because that's what schools use. Then you need to have your HACCP um, SOPs, and you're going to say that they're based on Nebraska Food Code 2016. You're going to name every meal that you serve, whether you're doing breakfast, lunch, you might be doing fresh fruit and vegetable, you might be doing after school snacks, you might have special milk program. You need to tell them what you're doing. And it's so that the when the health inspectors look at this, they know um, all the activities that you do <clears throat> when you're serving meals. And then you need to give the number of meals served. So each year you may, your enrollment may change. So you need to keep that updated. <clears throat> You need to list your vendors and suppliers, and anytime you change those, you need to write them down. <clears throat> you need to put your pest control operator in there and to ensure that they are a licensed pest control operator. That way, <clears throat> when someone is looking at your HACCP plan, they can see who the person is and that they are licensed and how often they come. Equipment, <clears throat> what type of equipment do you have? And it's gonna vary on each um, facility. Some of you that are just the finishing or the service only will have limited. You probably have a hot box and a refrigerator to keep the hot and cold items at temperature before you serve after they've already been delivered. Or you may be a complex kitchen that has every piece of equipment that anybody could think of. With the proofers, the combis, the convection ovens, the regular ovens, the burners, um, the reach-in coolers, the walk-in coolers, and the walk-in freezers, 
Um, they might have um, buffalo choppers or they might have specialty food processes um, equipment. Have to yes, we have a couple questions when you can pause a moment. Yes, we can. Go right ahead. Sure. The first question is on the food code, are you referring to the FDA food code or the Nebraska food code? The Nebraska food code. We okay. are based in the US, or sorry, the FDA and the USDA write the food code. And then it comes down to the states. And the states base are uh, the each state creates their own food code. And that is the food code that we are inspected on. The only thing that is different is that the public law for HACCP is the only difference that affects us that is federally mandated. <clears throat> Otherwise, we are underneath the Nebraska Food Code. Any other questions? Yes, we have a second question. Does the cashier from the office need to be listed in the plan even if we don't pay them? Yes, because it is not, this is not based on pay. This is actually based on food safety. And um, if the um, <clears throat> food, the cashier, um, you know, goes and touches something on the salad bar, maybe she grabs a carrot or a strawberry, um, <clears throat> then we, um, you, needs to be known that she works in there. And that's just to help them to, if they ever do have to do a foodborne illness, they look at um, all the people that are employed by you, and then they look at um, how maybe things might have been mishandled. Well, if she was eating off the salad bar with her fingers, just like if a principal or a superintendent do that, <laughs> you don't have to have them in there, but it's not a good thing. But you want to have those people listed so they know how many people they're going to be looking at when they do a foodborne illness investigation. And I hope that no one ever has to go through that. It's very intense. <clears throat> Any other questions? I'm going to take a drink real fast here, folks. Yeah, this is Michelle. Um... Are we listing volunteers too? Did you say that? Yes, if you have volunteers, you should list them also. Very good, Michelle. I have multiple volunteers. Um, so do I just keep my log? Um, I mean, they, they have to sign in. They have to sign in when they come into the building. That would be fine. Just keep your log with your um, plan. That would be great. Okay. <clears throat> Um, one thing I want to say about the equipment um, is that um, I hope that you all have a master plan for cleaning. And a lot of people will say, oh, we don't need a master plan. Everybody knows what they have to do. Well, if you have a master plan for cleaning, the new people have a record to do the cleaning and they know when to um, and they know when to when they need when it needs to be done sorry I was looking at our little uh, writing on the bottom of the page so they know when to do it because if it might be in someone's head but the new people that are coming on they may not know if they've never worked in a kitchen, all the cleaning that needs to be done is totally foreign to the new people. Okay. <clears throat> you also need to have a policy on visitors, teachers, students, nurses, coaches that come into your kitchen. And this has been added part of the food defense and um, of food safety because um, <clears throat> of the possibility of contamination um, and um, we ne need to make sure that people are not filling their personal cups by dipping it into the ice. And I did see that at a school last year where a teacher came in and her 
cup had not been washed for a while and she dipped it into the ice and um, away she went and filled it with ice or with water. Um, and she was out the door before anybody could stop her. So those are some of the things that we have to think of, you know, contamination, external contamination. Um, there was a report in another state that a group of kids had gone in to get ice for the, an athletic event and they thought it'd be funny to dump the bleach that was sitting on the floor into the um, ice after they left <clears throat> or when they were leaving because they thought it'd be funny, something funny for him to do. I don't think they thought it was funny afterwards. Okay, so now we're going to talk about um, the process charts. <clears throat> I need to speed it up here. And um, the process charts, we have the no cook, the cook and serve the same day, and the complex process, cook, cool, heat, and serve. <clears throat> The no cook is fairly simple. It's anything that you bring into your kitchen that is not cooked. Very self-explanatory. You're gonna receive it. <clears throat> you receive it and hold it at 41 degrees below or less. And then we're gonna talk about the SOPs that could be associated with the no cook, and then you're gonna get into groups. But one of the SOPs would be washing your hands before you handle them. And using suitable utensils, and only using those for the no cook um, items, and you change it between, say if you're going between um, tomatoes and lettuce you change the cutting board if you cut your own that's only if you cut your own <clears throat> okay the cook and serve the same day the critical control points we're going to have cooking temperatures um, and time for safety the tcs foods so cooking time for the tcs foods which is time temperature control for safety foods it used to be the potentially hazardous foods. We've also added pH to that um, when we talk about it for, uh, for other things, but for this on the cook and serve, we're only talking about the time and temperature controlling. And then of course, holding the temperature control foods for safety. And then again, what SOPs? Obviously hand washing would be one of them and using suitable utensils when handling ready to cook foods. Those two items are all on um, all three of these, it's the SOPs. So the cook, cool, heat, reheat, and serve, the complex process. You're cooking the TCS foods, you're cooling the TCS foods, you're reheating the TCS foods, and you're serving and hot holding the TCS foods. Example of that might be chili. You might cook it and serve it to the, next, the ground beef and then finish cooking it the next day. It could be lasagna where you cook off your ground beef and then you make your lasagna. <clears throat> and again, the SOPs, um, two of the SOPs for this is the hand washing and using the suitable utensils. All right. Are you ready? Beth? Yes. We have a couple of questions and maybe we can answer those before you talk about the chat room. Yes, that'd be awesome. The first one is, are there forms in the HACCP to fill out with all staff that help serve? Yes. Okay. So you want forms for all the people that help serve? Or are you talking about the description? You know? Doesn't say. Okay. If you're talking about the description, then you would just put that all in your uh, list of description and you can write it either in an outline form or a paragraph form. It doesn't matter. Um, and I've seen both. Um, so it's totally up to you on how you do that. 
Um, some write it as a story. This is what our kitchen is all about. And then some people just matter of factly say, this is our school, the name of the site. We serve 350 kids. We serve breakfast, lunch, and special milk. And um, then they say the equipment and all those fun things. But um, I'm not sure what you, if you're talking about on the serving line, if they have to fill some form out, I'm not sure what that would be. Any other there questions? Was, yep, there was one more, Beth. Um, what about lunches being kept in the milk cooler if the milk cooler is not in the kitchen? I believe that came up when you were talking about the SOPs at the beginning oh, or going I, through the, yep. Yep, I bet it, yes. Okay, <clears throat> so the food code is no personal items can be stored unless you have a designated refrigerator that is separate from anything that would be served to the public. So if you've got sack lunches in a milk cooler, that would not be an acceptable practice. If these are student um, and uh, milk or student lunches, you would have to designate a cooler or a section of your cooler and mark it student personal lunches. Any other questions? Yes, there was one that just, well, wow, more than one. <laughs> Do we just list the total number of employees slash volunteers, or do we have to write names down on the description? You should write how many full-time people you have, how many part-time people you have. Um, any, like if somebody comes in and just does lunch, and you would put, lunch and the number of hours they work. Um, some people have uh, volunteers that come in and work maybe 30 minutes and then another person comes in and works 30 minutes just for that meal period. And you could um, just say we have um, four people that come in for a half hour um, to work over lunch to get you through. Keep it simple. You have to have all the information, but keep it simple. Okay, we're gonna be going into the chat rooms now. Um, they don't have to be, unless they want to, then we can assign them. Okay, we're gonna be going into the chat rooms and uh, we will be breaking into groups. We will have you talk approximately 15 minutes and then we will um, to talk about the process charts and what you have got on your process charts. Um, we're going to divide you up into uh, groups and I'll go over the groups in just a minute. And then um, we also want you to think about the SOPs that would go with each of the processes that you're assigned. If you get done early before we bring you back, you can chat about what is going on in your school for getting ready to go back back to school if you want. Don't forget that you need to choose a recorder who will record your sponsors. Just list uh, maybe some of uh, the foods that you're thinking about putting into the different process charts and then list some of the SOPs that you think that will go with the process charts. Um, <clears throat> like the washing of the hands and the suitable utensils. And then the lead or the leader will report back to the group when we come back and it, they can be short. They don't have to be long when you come back. Okay, so groups one through three, you guys are gonna be reporting back to us on the no cook process chart and the related SOPs. Groups four through six is the cook and serve process chart and the related SOPs. Do we have enough for 10? Okay. Okay, so groups seven through 10, you're gonna be doing the complex um, process for the cook, cool, reheat, serve, and related um, SOPs. You guys have a little bit tougher, so there's more groups. And when you answer the chat room, again, make sure that you are 
remember what chat room you're in. You're going to choose a recorder who will re um, send your responses to me, Beth Haas, sorry, Beth.Haas at Nebraska.gov. We'll put that in the chat room too. And also choose a lead who will report back to us. So you'll be going into the rooms now as Jenna gets you going. We'll see you back in 15 minutes. Um, we'll start with group. We'll start with group one and have you report back on your no process chart and your related SOPs that you came up with. I got to be the lead, the reporter back for one. Awesome. Uh, that is great. Oh, yeah. uh, we decided like all your, your fruits and vegetables that go on your salad bar, your, if you make coleslaw, that kind of stuff, milks, juices that you pull out and let's thaw in your fridge if they're frozen for the juices and that kind of stuff. Very if good. Smoothies. <laughs> mm-hmm. Any other pre and if you did like a hoagie sandwich, any cold sandwiches you pulled out, watched. And the SOPs we just washing the fruits and vegetables and limiting the time that this stuff is out in the air and air kept it cool and within its temperature zone. That's Very good. All. Good. So did you come up with any SOPs? that you would use in those? Oh. For every one all we said now on that. <laughs> I... Anybody can help him. What about washing the fruits and vegetables and making sure you wash them for 30 seconds though? We have an SOP for that. Um, pers uh, personal hygiene as well. Uh, storing and using poisonous toxic chemicals, the SOP on that, so that you're not storing it close or not dumping it onto the <clears throat> um, produce. You know, way back when, um, <clears throat> They were having a, this was, gosh, probably in the 1980s, they were having uh, people wash the, or rinse the strawberries with bleach in, <clears throat> because of the E. coli. And um, they quit that process because <clears throat> people were putting it on straight. Or they were putting the solution was too, um, heavy on bleach and it was making people as sick as what the E. coli was. So they went away from that process of doing with bleach. <clears throat> so some of the other things that are recommended for SOPs are your um, personal hygiene, um, using a calibrated food thermometer for um, <clears throat> taking the temperatures, to make sure the food is at 41 or below. Uh, preventing cross-contamination during storage and preparation. You don't want to store any raw meat products above your fresh produce um, because if it would spill, <clears throat> it would get all over it. Cleaning and sanitized food contact surfaces. You're receiving deliveries. You're handling of a root food recall. Controlling time and temperature, doing prep. Um, you're cold, holding your cold, potentially, potentially, your cold TCS foods, <clears throat> um, using the time alone as a public health control. We don't see that used very much in Nebraska because our health inspectors and um, the, that side of it don't encourage that. <clears throat> date marking, got to date mark everything that's in the refrigerator, transporting, serving food, and preventing cross-contamination of food bars trying to control those little kids that want to come up and just grab a handful of strawberries. Okay, two, <clears throat> group two, what did you come up with? Well, we came up pretty much with the same, same thing you just said, everything. We had, we 
focused on sub sandwiches more uh, and stuff like that. Uh, but we were wondering, like I I printed out the new SOPs how you you send us to print out, uh -huh. and like our old no cook food processing chart on the bottom has the list of SOPs and stuff like that on it, but like your new one didn't have any. That's because they want <clears throat> um, they want you to put the SOPs in there according to your kitchen and what okay, you do. Mm -hmm. We were wondering, do we add another line to this or what do we do for the paper? How do we? You can put it either another line or you can just type below the text box. Okay, it's so just a text a, box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it wasn't too much room on the paper. So, you know, we were talking about that kind of stuff. Yeah, if, if you um, download it as a Word document or a fillable document, I think is what it is now. And if it's not, we'll get it in one of those. And then you can um, just type it in below that. Okay. Will it be a Google Doc? Do you know? Um, we can make it a Google Doc. Because I think a lot of us have Google Docs. So it'd yep. be nice to we do We can that. make a Google Doc. Okay. <clears throat> Otherwise, we pretty much, what you said, the SLPs and all that, I mean, it's pretty much every SLP has to go in it no matter what you do. No cook, mm -hmm. whatever. So. Yep. Very so, good. Okay, thank you. Group three, do you have anything else to report? Group three. We uh, focused on ground beef that would be used at a later date. Can you hey. hear me? Yep, yeah. we can hear you. Okay. Go ahead, Susan. And uh, Anyway, you know, by washing your hands and washing and sanitizing the surface that you're going to prepare your meat on, it's raw. So the ground beef would put, be put in either your steamer pot or a pan on the stove to be browned. Uh, brown it to a temperature of 165 and then drain it and cool it using ice and cold water. Uh, works for me. It'll bring it down to about 70 degrees within two hours. And then um, putting that in clean containers and cooling it down to that 41 degrees before we store it at 41 degrees or below, dating and labeling it. And then when we use it to reheat it to 165 for 15 seconds, and according to the recipe, serve with the appropriate uh, equipment. Very good. Size for each group. Very good. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, group four, you have the cook and serve process charts. <coughs> group four. Hi, Beth. Um, we talked about, um, it seems like uh, most kitchens would use this one the most, mm -hmm. um, you know, putting your hamburger patty that's pre-cooked, your chicken nuggets that's pre-cooked, your item, and your, uh, how your temperature on there. Um, the SOPs would be, I know uh, from previously when our kitchen uh, had some chicken nuggets and we got them out of the freezer, put them on the pan, and we covered it and instead of pushing it into the cooler until we cooked it we had it sitting out and we got dinged for that so i always remember that you know that you need to make sure that you properly store it until you're ready to cook it nice. uh, yep <clears throat> and then of course hold it until it's served Mm -hmm. And uh, I know in our school, we try to get darn close to what we need, and we're doing more discarding of the unused product any more than saving it. Um, so, yep. And then we kind of discussed other things in our kitchen, you know, as to what we're doing. So, mm -hmm. good. Anyway. <clears throat> Right. Good. Very good. Um, group five. <clears throat> I 
Uh, we did the ground beef as well. Um, so just cooking, um, you know, cleaning the area, um, washing your hands before you get started and then um, cook your ground beef to uh, 155 for 17 seconds using a thermometer. Um, and then using it right away so you'd uh, put it on the line, serve it with appropriate utensils. Um, Carrie, jump in here too. I can't remember everything. <laughs> you wrote it down. Yeah, and then um, the SOP would be the hot holding. I just had it here. The hot or hold for hot service, you know, mm -hmm. so it doesn't get out of the temperature zones. Um, and if it's timed out in those four hours, throw it away. If it's under those four hours, you know, do a cool down sheet with it. I think that's all I, else I had. Very good. Group six. Group, group six. I think I was in group six and I think we did the wrong one. We did the complex process chart. That's all right. What uh, did you have? So um, turkey roast is usually what I do at my school. Um, and I have an older, um, older form. So the SOPs would be um, thawing the raw meats, um, cooling to prevent the growth of foodborne bacteria, and then the hot, <laughs> cold holding, and then um, cooling foods properly. And then someone had said something about macaroni salad they thought should be on, a comp on the complex because you have to get that down to 40 degrees before you can serve it. Mm -hmm. Very good. So. That's an excellent one. <clears throat> and I think this year with the COVID, I think I'm gonna do less of the complex stuff and more with the easier stuff because it's just gonna be one of them years. Right, and you're gonna be busy doing other things too, um, <clears throat> getting everything organized. And <clears throat> if you have to wrap silverware, we'll be wrapping silverware. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, group seven, the complex process. Group seven. Okay, that would be me, or our group. Um, we went for chili, so we, none of these are in order. Um, holding or holding the hot foods SOP, the hand washing, cooling down your SO, the cooling down SOP, uh, the actual cooking, reheating SOP, cleaning and sanitizing, preventative uh, cross contamination, cross contamination, um, dating and marking, proper utensil use, recording temperatures. Uh, that's all I have. Very good. And I guess we use chili or beans and weenies. Oh, those are both good ones. Okay. Um, group eight. Group eight, who was your spokesperson, your leader? I have to unmute. Group eight. Okay, we'll come back to group nine. Group nine. <laughs> group nine, the complex. I think that was me or our group, but I forgot the number. But I know we right. I know we were complex. Okay. So we talked about the browning hamburger for whatever you're using it for, um, or making turkeys at Thanksgiving, that would be a complex meal. Um, one of the ladies had a, uses an ice paddle to cool her food down, which we all thought was really cool. Um, we all need to go buy one of those. 
Um, and we talked about you need to cook it to, is it 155 for 17 seconds? Is that right? Right, very good. Okay, and then cooling it down and then reheating it the next day to 155, would that be right? Uh, if, anytime you reheat, it's 165. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> and it gets confusing between cooking temperature and then the reheat temperature. Yes. So our SOPs would be washing your hands, preventing cross-contamination when storing, um, calibrating your thermometers, cooking, cooling, holding it, um, date marking it, and uh, leftovers, S uh, you know, a SOP for leftovers. Very so that's good. what we have. Very good. <clears throat> okay, group 10. Group 10. We were all pretty shy in group 10. Um, but ours, we came up with pretty much the same ideas as everybody else. Um, we were talking, we talked about beef, cooking beef the day before, cooking it, cooling it, and reheating it. We came up with turkeys for turkey and gravy, and we did cut, had mentioned macaroni and cheese too. And um, our SOPs were the same as everybody else, cooking, cooling, and reheating, along with, uh, I don't know, that first group had all the SOPs, so they had way more than us. So I'll follow theirs. <laughs> Good. <clears throat> Excellent job. One of the reasons why we did the process charts <clears throat> for the HASA program is we communicate with Mandy and her group every year. And um, <clears throat> we talk about the different things of food safety that they see in schools. And one of the things of when they were reviewing the um, HACCP plans this year, they noticed that a lot of schools had not updated and they had not done their process charts. A lot of people didn't even have process charts and um, a lot of them had process charts, but they hadn't been touched since they created the program back in 2005. And so a lot of things were missing and they weren't doing the same things. So that is why we did this today. <clears throat> Does anyone have any questions? Beth, I have a question. Mm -hmm. When, um, are, are you guys going to put out, um, a guideline for um, just about serving kids and are you, you know what I mean? I mean, we, we were talking in our group about, you know, we're going to plan to have the kids walk through the lunch line. They won't be able to pick anything up, but, you know, my understanding is a para can hand milk to each student and put silverware on their tray. Um, are you going to put out anything that gives us um, all of this? You know what I mean? Like a chart or something? Or are we going to have to go through and, you know, I've written so many notes, but just a question. Yeah, we are not, um, just because we have so many counties that are and um, areas that are in different levels, um, we have <clears throat> several that may be going back to the red zone. <clears throat> and um, so we are just giving recommendations and guidance. We're not saying this is the way it's going to be because if we did, then the ones that could you know, because we have some that may be going to green. We just don't know. It depends on each health, de local health department. Um, <clears throat> they're the ones that have the final say. And I don't know if you're, <clears throat> the majority of the health departments, not all of them, the local ones have um, seen the school plan or in the process of reviewing your school plan. And hopefully they <clears throat> have that in, uh, your superintendent shared your process with the locals and they are going to either approve it or say that you need to up it. Um, so, and it, they'll base that all on how active COVID is in your area and that's how they do that. 
Um, <clears throat> it's going to be locally done. Um, like Lancaster and Douglas County are all in uh, mask um, requirements. You have to be masked. Um, you don't have to be masked in <clears throat> the um, buildings unless you're in close uh, proximity to other people. But um, I'm masked because the air filter system in the state office building is not really good. Um, they don't recycle fresh air very often. Yeah, so it's not a good thing. So that's why I'm masked. <clears throat> so those are kind of the reasons. Um, that we, we just can't tell everybody what to do. We have to give you guidance and recommendations. So just because it's so different in each area, um, our main concern is that everybody keeps safe and the kids keep safe. So any okay. other questions? Yeah, Beth, should we have an SOP then for wearing masks and, and stuff? You could. Um, our COVID SOPs that we have on our website on the front page of the um, nutrition services those SOPs um, are pretty generic, but um, yeah, you could have them for, and not everybody will be wearing masks. We encourage it, um, but uh, it's not required, but you, your school may want to do that. And it's totally up to the school and what the local health departments are saying. Mandy recommends it, we recommend it, but. Yeah, and if you want to put do a mask SOP, you can. Um, <clears throat> and then it should go into your um, pandemic um, <clears throat> part of your HACCP plan. And we'll talk a little bit more about that next week. And, or not next week, on the 13th at one o'clock, we'll be back. And if you can't join us, we will record it. I know some people will be back and um, <clears throat> it'll be a half day. They won't be doing lunch. I know some will be in full um, school, um, <clears throat> but um, it will be recorded for those of you that cannot join us. Beth, this is Janice from the Northeast Nebraska. Uh -huh. um, mine is like way different than all of the rest of the people that are online right now. Mine is a correctional facility. Uh huh. So do I, would I have to follow the same guidelines as a standard school? You're going to have to um, talk to your local health department and ask them for guidance on that. Um, <clears throat> they may be more strict with you because you are a residential. Okay, yeah, because um, as I say, some of my HACCP plan is way different than what people have been talking. Mine, are, mine is a little more strict where I have yep. a lot more paperwork. Yep because you are yeah and that's because your kids are with you 24 7 seven days a week and um so it requires other things so check with your local health department to make sure you're um in compliance for the covid part of it and um <clears throat> the health department when the dhhs when they come to inspect they will look at you differently too because okay, of that. so so should i attend the has up meeting next week seeing how it's not quite Geared that, towards me. That's up to you. Okay, because I, I was say I was reading through my material and what you've been saying, and it's like, well, oh, they're not the same. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay, thank you. Uh huh. Any other questions? Beth, I have a question. Like okay. in Syracuse, where our kitchen and serving area is just all one big room, and uh -huh. it is just it's just split with our hot wells. Mm -hmm. Is it smart to have the kids come through there or should we set tables up out front? Because our kids are getting everything mm -hmm. like in a three compartment container and it's just kind of going to be handed to them. Should I have them in that area where we're close to prep, well, close to prep area or should I keep them out of it? That is a good question and I would talk to your local health department. Okay. Because um, um, I'm not... I know what my answer would be, but check with them. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> yep. Thank you. Uh huh. Beth, we have a couple questions in the chat box if you awesome. want me to read them. Okay. That'd be great. Um, the first one Should you use new gloves after every job and washing before and after changing gloves? 
Yes, you should. Anytime you change tasks, you need to change your gloves and wash your hands. And you wash your hands before and after you take your gloves off, before you put them on and after you take them off. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. What is your take on reusing the prepackaged items and the ones we package? Can we sanitize package or just throw out? The ones that you package cannot be reused if a student took it. And that's because it's too easy for them to open the lid and spit on it or do other things to it, dump a bunch of salt, anything like that. And so you don't want those items back. <clears throat> they, um, Mandy did say that it was okay that you can, uh, doesn't recommend it, but she said you could return the prepackaged, the commercially prepackaged items and then use them at a later date. But um, not recommended now, but during the regular portions, um, when we, if we ever go back to normal, <clears throat> that would be acceptable. Now it's depending on how your activity of COVID is. Um, and talk to your local health department um, about it. Get to know those people. They're there to help you guys. Um, they may not be the ones that inspect you, but they are there to help you and to um, make sure that the kids are safe during COVID. This is where their expertise is. And couldn't, they re couldn't they reuse them as long as they could uh, sanitize them? You if the pre the commercially prepackaged, it's not recommended, but you can reuse them. Um, Mandy said, does it sanitize them and stick them in the refrigerator for a day or two? <clears throat> but she doesn't recommend that. But look at your cost also. We have another one um, with same day cooking. It's kind of a good question, I think. Um, if you cook hamburger for spaghetti to serve the same day, does the hamburger have to be cooled down and then reheated when put all together with the sauce to 165 degrees? That is a great question, <clears throat> and it depends on how long or how far ahead of time you cook your hamburger. If you cook your hamburger at seven o'clock when you come in and you don't add it to the sauce until 10, 1030, right before you go to service, hopefully you don't do that, you would need to cool it down. But if you're going to add it to it, <clears throat> say you cooked it and you're going to add it um, at seven o'clock and then you're going to add it to it as soon as the sauce, as soon as the ground beef reaches the 155 for 50, or 17 seconds. So used to that 15 seconds. So it's 17 seconds. <clears throat> then you can go ahead and add it directly into the sauce. Then you don't and you're going to start cooking it so that it develops all that wonderful flavor. Um, you can do it directly into the um, sauce. Okay, I'll move on to the next one. Are the process charts to be filled out every day in place of the old charts we used previous? The process charts, those are what you do at the beginning of the school year when you're doing your menu, you write up the process charts. Um, and then if you add anything to uh, your menu during the school year, you would put those in the proper process chart. Um, and then you go forward. You don't have to do the process charts every day. You're doing the log temperatures every day, or the logs. So your sanitizer log, your cooking temperatures, your refrigeration and freezer temperatures, um, the food safety checklist list that you do once a month. Those are the things that you have to do on a regular basis. Good. Question about silverware. There's two questions. Um, if we have a para or volunteer handing out silverware, will we need to wrap them? And then to follow that, there was a question, can we wrap silverware in napkins and place it on the tray? Um, yes to both. If you have a para that's doing, that's doing the silverware and placing it on the, um, with a napkin on the tray, you don't have to wrap. And if you're wrapping them and placing them on, that's perfectly acceptable. So both of them are right. 
Whichever is the easiest. Yep. Okay, once once we update an SOP, do we remove the old SOP from our HACCP record or should we keep both? You want to get rid of the old SOP. And is there a new manual book for HACCP? There is not a new manual. The 2005 manual is still in place, even though the SOPs are outdated. <clears throat> um, those were put into the book as samples. And um, we try to keep you guys updated on the food code and the, has, or the SOPs updated so that you're in the current year. So as you are reviewing these this year, make sure that you have the SOPs that are in the 2016. Not all the updated SOPs are on our website, but we're trying to get them up there. Jenna has been the only one here since March. And um, so she's doing all of our programs um, and is the administrative assistant, office associate, um, I think is her new title. And she does it for all of us. And she's tech support, everything. She's here with me today. So we'll get those up as fast as we can. Anything else? Beth, I'd just like to add, there were a couple of questions about uh, what a guide for what you do put in your HACCP plan. And I did post Very the good. link to the USDA manual, which does have an example of a site information form in it. But we will also be compiling these questions and answers and putting them on a resource document on with this, this webinar, right? Correct, we will. We'll have all the questions will be um, uploaded and with the answers. Um, and we will also um, <clears throat> have, we actually do have the links to the uh, current food code and to the HACCP guide on our website. If you go to the um, food safety page of ours, they're on there, the SOPs are on there. And, um, <clears throat> We also have the food safety inspectors on there and any food safety training classes that we know of are also posted there. So it's a good site for you guys to see. <clears throat> and um, Sean has been putting those up on the, who's my, um, in your chat box all day, the <clears throat> different websites for you. And um, when we get the new, food code, whether it's this year or next year, um, whenever that gets passed and then they get it written because the lawyers have to okay the um, <clears throat> actual writing <laughs> in the food code, um, <clears throat> we will get the link sent to you so that you can um, make copies of it so that you're current. And we'll talk about that next on August 13th at one o'clock also. Um, so. Hey Beth. I do, yeah. I know this isn't, um, HACCP related, but, um, what are we doing about the offer versus surf? That is up to your school on okay. whether it depends on how you're feeding. If you're in, if you're feeding in the cafeteria, you can do the offer versus serve. Um, if you are doing in the classroom, um, <clears throat> some people are doing offer versus serve because they're sending down, um, the, you know, bags of things for the kids to choose from and they just tell who is ever serving and other ones are pre portioning and so they are not doing it. So everybody's doing it a little bit different. So as long as we are portioning them behind and serving them ourselves, we can still operate under offer versus serve, even though we don't have the salad bar. Yes, you just have to ask them, would okay. you like peas or carrots? Okay. Just perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Okay, I, I do want to thank Donna and Allie and Sean and Jenna for helping me today to get through. Uh, Keep asking your questions because when you if you do it by yourself, watching the chat box and trying to get people into chat rooms and um, <clears throat> putting things into the chat 
room that you guys need. Um, it's just hard for one person to do. So I appreciate them helping me. And I hope to see a lot of you next on August the 13th at one o'clock. We'll be sending out the Zoom um, invitation either today or tomorrow. And um, <clears throat> then we'll do a reminder. We'll, and I'll let everybody know or we'll be posting or sending an email out, even though you were on here, you'll get an email saying that when it's posted, the recording. So if you have somebody you wanna see. Other than that, if you guys don't have any questions, we will uh, hopefully see you August the 13th or at another one of our um, trainings, webinars, Zoom.